So Greg Harbour is our speaker for tonight. He has done numerous programs for numerous different organizations about birds. He's been, I'm not sure, how long have you been doing, you've been following birds, Greg? Uh, ever since I was a kid, I grew up down in South Florida and, and for me, all the, what I call the charismatic waders, the big birds, those were the ones that caught my attention early on. Uh, but probably what cemented my interest in birds was the um, spot-breasted orioles that used to visit the backyard. Uh, they would come to the passion flower vine and, and drink the nectar out of the flowers. So just imagine a, like a Baltimore oriole, if you know what that looks like, just add a few more spots on the breast and you've got an instant, <laughs> instant captivating uh, bird there. It really is. And uh, Greg works at UAB in, uh, in the, as an assistant in the microbiology department. Is, do I have that right? Yes. That, that's correct. And uh, I know he keeps track of birds at Railroad Park and probably some other places, but I know um, Greg, Greg's one of our famous birders in the Birmingham area. So we are just so proud and so thrilled to have you with us tonight to share your knowledge with us. Well, I'm ha happy to be here and thanks for the invitation to speak to your group. Uh, it's good to see so many familiar faces. So, hey, hey everybody. Um, so I guess I should go ahead and share my screen. So just to give you a heads up, uh, I'll share my screen here. And um, so what I thought I would do would be to, I've got a, a PowerPoint that I wanted to show you. But before we even get to that, I wanted to, um, to introduce uh, uh, something that you may or may not be familiar with already, and that is something called eBird. And so when I was, um, when Linda Neighbors first asked me about uh, doing the program, I said, sure, I'd be happy to do something on the birds of Shades Creek. So I thought, well, what can I do? I mean, I know that I have birded along Shades Creek over the years and have seen some birds, but I thought, you know, I really should um, get the latest information on what birds are being seen in various sites along the creek. And so for me, the obvious choice was to go to a website that's called eBird. It's just eBird.org. So I don't know if you can see my screen here, but this is a Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, website, and it's probably, I would say, the largest community science, uh, community uh, research, if you want to call it that, uh, organization that is out there in the world. I think it has probably over In the U.S. and then they just kept adding and adding and adding and so now it's just a tremendous database of sightings that you can either uh, submit your own sightings or you can go ahead and just go to the website and look up a particular thing you know if there's a particular place you wanted to visit. So in my case I've already created I've got a, a an account so I just log in and you can go to this explore tab and so I've already pulled up when you go ahead and type in the county that you want to visit and so we're going to go to Jefferson County Alabama and then when you click on the hotspot map that's over here on the left it pulls up the entire county. So I've already kind of zoomed in on the area that I wanted to show you on another, uh, on, on another page here that I just pulled up. And so uh, obviously what I wanted to do was to look at various places along Shades Creek. So I know that this group knows that Shades Creek, of course, kind of gets its, its headwaters or up there by the Mount Brook uh, racetrack. And so about the first location that you come to, so the headwaters are up here, but the first publicly accessible spot that is um, marked on here that's on the park. So you can click on that and it will bring up all the details of all the birds 
that have been reported there. So you can go to it and lo and behold, as of yesterday, Pelham Rowan uh, submitted that he Cerulean Warbler there. So that is great news, obviously, because that is one spectacular bird. But if we back up a little bit and go to um, some of the other sites, along the creek, you, you'll see that the next one that's a little further downstream from there, uh, let me get my bearings here again, make sure I'm not overshooting my spots here. So here's Flora Johnson. And then the next one down is the, let me zoom in one more click here. So the next one is the Irondale Furnace Trail. So if we click on that, you can pull that up and look at the details. And you can see that Craig Wilson was the last person to visit there on the 4th of April. So, and so on down the line, you can just go to all these different sites along the river. So I think the next one down from there is, um, let's see, I think it's Jemison Park is the next location. Let me get my bearings here again. So here's Irondale Furnace, and then there's Jemison Park, and then we've got um, the uh, Homewood Forest Preserve site is right here. Zoom in one more here. So Homewood Forest Preserve is one location uh, that has 45 species. Then we have the, um, the Shades Creek Greenway uh, lists 95 species, and you can just keep going on down all the way down the length of Shades Creek. There's a few more down here near Ross Bridge. And then I think the last uh, place on the Shades Creek is the, um, you know, the Cahaba River Park. And I don't think I'm quite there. Let me go a little bit further down, getting closer, getting closer. <laughs> so. Here it is, Cahaba River Park. So if you click on that, it shows that there are 123 species. So in Todd DeVore, my friend Todd, some of you probably know Todd, uh, was there as of yesterday. And so if you, I bring all this up so that you know that if you are ever going to a particular area along the creek or anywhere for that matter, um, you can always go in and look to see what birds are being seen there currently. And you mentioned uh, Aldridge Gardens. And so that is also a birding hotspot. Here it is right here. And so it has 109 species on it. So this is a really great, great resource. I would encourage you that if you don't already have uh, an account on eBird that you please go ahead and, um, and do yourself a favor and open an account uh, and start, you know, enter, logging in your data, logging in your sightings. The nice thing about it is you can, it'll keep track of all your, um, your sightings for you. You don't have to worry about keeping a list of, you know, what birds did I see where, all you got to do is put it on eBird and it's always going to be there. You get to access your data. And the best part about it is the scientists at Cornell also get to use your data. And so, and a lot of that data uh, gets used in many, many, many publications about bird population trends and things of that nature. So it really is valid research that you are contributing to. But what I thought I would do tonight, based on the, the various uh, sites that I checked out, I, I thought I would go ahead and we're just going to do a little bit of a virtual tour uh, down Shades Creek. And I'm going to highlight some of the birds that if you were to make this trip, like this weekend or tomorrow or what have you, some of the birds that you might conceivably see either you know, on that trip or maybe in another month or so when, uh, when breeding season is in full swing and the birds are intent on nesting and the males are singing on territory. So we'll go ahead and get started and we'll start up here at the top. 
And so, of course, the first map is just what I've already kind of covered, the Shades Creek from the headwaters here up above uh, the racetrack and all the way down to its confluence with the Cahaba River. And so I wanted to start at Flora Johnson Park. Um, you are probably familiar with that. Uh, just downstream from here, this is the view looking uh, downstream. A little bit further down here is where Irondale Furnace is located and across from the furnace is where the Audubon Session Sanctuary is located. Uh, so here is a picture of the Irondale Furnace uh, entryway and the little trail uh, that leads down to it. Uh, this is not Shades Creek here, but this is, I believe they call this Furnace Creek. And years ago, I used to house it for a friend who lived in uh, this neighborhood just a few blocks from this location. And it was always so tempting to me. They had a habit of going on their vacation uh, up to uh, North Carolina in spring and in fall and right at the peak of migration. So I would have to drive past this spot every morning on my way to work. So if I built in a few extra minutes, I would always go ahead and just walk the path down. And it was always amazing to me how much bird life there was along the creek. Now, this photograph was made just last weekend, um, but in a little bit, another couple weeks or so, it might be leafed out even a little bit more and also in the fall. But what always struck me was how many birds you would see right along this little creek. And it kind of reiterates what I've always heard over the years in that birds use river systems and geographic features, whether it's rivers or ridgeline, um, you know, you name it, that those are like little guideposts for them. And I can remember a couple, several years ago now, I was flying back from a trip that I had taken down to visit my family in Florida. And for whatever reason, our flight, when it came back, went through New Orleans. And it just so happened that it was actually just a couple weeks after the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill. And so in addition to having a quote, you know, front row seat of the Deepwater Horizon spill, is we were driving or flying up, essentially coming straight up I-2059 through the west side of Alabama, is we're flying over the Tom Bigby River, the Tom Bigby Waterway, it, it really just struck me how much that feature just looks like, okay, this is the map. This is what the birds are seeing. And so it, it, it made me realize then how much birds rely on these things. And, you know, we know from banding studies and, and other studies that birds really do visit these places time and time and time again. Um, so it's not some fluke. They really are using these features for that very purpose. But if you get down to Shades Creek there at Irondale Furnace, this is what it looks like at the bend in the river. So this is the Audubon Session Sanctuary on this side, on the right side. And over here on the left is the extension of the trail that goes all the way out to um, Way. And then this is the waterfront there. And I put in this photograph because it reminded me of the fact that there are certain species of birds that, you know, this is the kind of habitat they like. And in particular, I'm thinking of Louisiana water thrush, which is a bird we'll see very shortly, and also birds like spotted sandpipers. Uh, the water thrush breeds here, but the sandpiper is just passing through. But this is precisely the kind of habitat that they would go for. And then when I was there just last weekend there on Jemison Trail, um, it, it, the, the red buckeye was in bloom and it was appropriate to, to put in this photograph because I always tell people in the spring, especially in the early spring, that when the hummingbirds, the ruby-throated hummingbirds are returning, 
to our area, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, I haven't seen a hummingbird yet. And so my first question to them is, do you by any chance have red buckeye blooming near you? And if the answer is yes, well, there's your reason why you're not seeing the ruby-throated hummingbird is because Mother Nature is providing all the nutrients that they need. Yes, they'll, they will come to a feeder, but there are plenty of natural um, sources of the nectar. And in particular, the red buckeye is one that, I, you know, it's just the two go hand in hand. It, it's no coincidence that the red buckeye is blooming at the same time that the ruby-throated hummingbirds are returning. Uh, it, same thing with the, um, the yellow poplar, the tulip poplar trees with their blooms and the return of the Orioles. Um, it's just, it goes hand in hand. So, but what I wanted to do was to begin this little quest, this little story, a, a journey that we're going to take with something that you may not think of as being a bird along the creek, but indeed a wood duck, in this particular case, it's a male wood duck. Um, this beautiful bird, I actually photographed this one right here at Railroad Park within just a couple weeks of when it opened, uh, this bird showed up. And I haven't seen one there since, but somebody else actually photographed one there uh, last fall. So they do indeed uh, visit the area, but wood ducks up and down the creek is certainly, this is a bird you could easily see there. And they nest in cavities. And so if you know of location along the creek where a wood duck box could be uh, erected, installed, by all means, I would encourage you to put one up because they will indeed um, use a nest box. Um, but they are cavity nesters. Uh, another location that I know that I have seen them, in addition to the area there by Flora Johnson Park, um, the area behind where the Walmart is there on Lakeshore, I have seen uh, wood ducks as well as this next bird, the hooded merganser. I have seen them in, in that particular spot. And so both spectacular birds. The, the wood duck is a fairly common breeding bird for us. Uh, hooded bergansers somewhat less so, but they are um, actually breeding birds in Alabama. Just a really spectacular bird. Um, I should have included a, a, a photograph of the male with his crest raised, uh, but that'll be your homework assignment for this week, uh, is to find a picture of a hooded merganser with his the male with his crest up because it really is just a spectacular sight. And then one of the more common birds that you would certainly see along the creek is the great blue heron. Um, just before the program got started, I was talking to Michelle and Linda about places that you can see uh, great blue herons nesting along the creek. And Todd, Todd DeVore, I mentioned his name earlier, was telling me that uh, he had gone to uh, Freshwater Land Trust uh, site that's on the, I guess that would be the west side of 65 uh, on, the, on Shades Creek. And lo and behold, there are uh, some great blue herons nesting there. And so all along the creek, this is a spectacular bird. When you see him flying overhead, it's kind of like, oh my God, it looks like a, a pterodactyl. They really are just spectacular birds uh, to see, and I, I love seeing them. Uh, I will mention, this is the one bird that a lot of people will call them cranes, but in reality, they are not cranes. Uh, they are the great blue herons. So this is a nice uh, adult that we have here. And this is one that I photographed. I believe this was at East Lake Park, actually. And then another uh, of the large wading birds that you could see along the creek would be the great egret. And so this is the largest of the white egrets. The largest of the herons would be the great blue heron. And then the great egret is the largest of the white herons or egrets. And I always tell people if you're trying to identify a heron 
or an egret, the two things that you would want to focus on are the leg color and the foot color, and then also the bill color, just because there are several different species of egrets and or herons that are white, but the good news is that they have different colored legs and or feet combinations in combination with their beak. So if you can just focus on those, um, it will help you tremendously in terms of narrowing down uh, which of the, of the large-legged waders, the charismatic waders, as I call them, is, that you're looking at. So the great blue and the great egret are both species that we have here year-round in the Birmingham area. This next bird is one that you probably have seen uh, along the creek if you've spent any time there. And this is the yellow crowned night heron. And you can see that it does indeed have a yellow plume on its head. So it is an appropriately named bird. And this is the adult here. And this is what the juvenile uh, bird looks like here. And these are just now returning to our area. So this is a bird that actually migrates. Uh, every once in a blue moon, we might have a yellow crowned night heron that uh, that overwinters uh, in the Birmingham area, but usually when that that has been injured in some way or is not able to fly or you know what have you, but for the most part, these birds they're they're coming back now. They I've seen them like at Railroad Park and East Lake for about maybe three weeks now, so they start to come back about mid March. Uh, and then they will be here pretty much through about the end of October. So this is a, a bird that we have here for several, several months. And they don't always nest right on the river. Sometimes they will nest several blocks, maybe even a mile or so away from a water source. But you can always reliably find them near water. And one of their favorite things to feed on is um, crayfish. And so these particular birds were photographed also at Railroad Park. And then two of the migrant birds that we have coming through, and you may not think of these as, you know, why would a bird like this, why would a shorebird be along Shades Creek? Well, spotted sandpiper is one. And so I mentioned when I was showing you the photograph of the rocky shoals there at Jemison Park, that is great habitat for them because they like to get up and look under the rocks and they walk along the, the shoreline. So wherever you've got exposed shoreline, that is really good uh, habitat to look for them. But in migration, so they're, they're coming through now, and they'll be coming back through in the fall. Uh, but in the fall, they look a little bit different. They don't show the spots that you see here. So this was the bird I photographed in the spring, also at Railroad Park. Um, it, but what gets... Constantly teetering their butt as they walk. They just cannot hold still, their, their little butt is just constantly wagging up and down. And it's not that they're promiscuous or anything like that, it's just that it's like a nervous tick that they have. And so, um, so that's always fun to see them. And when you see them flying, they tend to just barely skim the surface of the water and they have this very fluttery flight. It's like they, they flap their wings just long enough to a little bit, but just right above the surface of the water as they're going uh, along the creek's edge. And quite often, uh, you know, they're following these river systems. I can remember uh, doing a, a, a rafting trip uh, up there. It wasn't the Ocoee, maybe it was the Chattooga River uh, up there in North Georgia. And lo and behold, this was like in late August, and lo and behold, there was one of these birds up in the mountains, essentially, just 
puttering along the river's edge. And I knew right away, I didn't need any binoculars, just right away I could tell by the way it was flying if that's indeed what it was. And then another of the sandpipers that you will see along the, the shore, along the edge, would be the solitary sandpipers. And I can honestly say that these birds are just now coming back uh, and passing through. So just like the spotted sandpiper does not breed here, the solitary sandpiper does not breed here. These birds are headed to the tundra, especially the solitary sandpiper, they're headed to the tundra. Long, long way to go yet. And so this is a bird I photographed uh, yesterday at Railroad Park, but you know, just like Railroad Park, Shades Creek, all of these places have value as stopover habitat for birds that need just a place to rest and feed. Um, you know, last night's storms uh, put a damper on bird migration. And so this particular bird uh, just based of today. And so my, my feeling is that the bird is finding enough food there in the little mud flats uh, there along the edge of the creek to feed on these invertebrates. And so, you know, I suspect that tonight, now that the weather has cleared, uh, bird migration will resume for a lot of birds. You may or may not know that uh, bird migration happened primarily at night. When birds are actually flying, it's primarily at night for a number of different reasons. Uh, the weather tends to be a little bit less windy at night unless there's a front passing through. And then also at night, they have the advantage of flying under the cover of darkness so they don't have to worry about predators as much. And so my feeling is that the solitary sandpiper park will probably be gone tomorrow because of the favorable conditions that we will have tonight versus last night's storm. So let's go ahead and look at some of the land birds that you might encounter along the creek. So we're gonna keep moving along the creek and maybe not so much, uh, these might be birds that you could see or better yet, birds that you would hear. So this time of the year, a lot of our birds are starting to set up breeding territory, nesting territory. And males are loudly singing, trying to establish a territory to keep away other males, while at the same time trying to attract a mate. So if, if you listen to the red-bellied woodpecker, you'll find- Red-bellied woodpecker. Oh, I just wanted to play that little segment for you because this is a very, very familiar bird for many people. This is one that is common in our yards, in our parks. And so the key to learning to identify birds by their songs is to become familiar with the common bird so that when you hear something that sounds a little bit different, it's like, okay, so that one stands out to me as being different than what I was might normally have expected. So the red-bellied woodpecker, thankfully, is one that in addition to being very uh, common and I would even say abundant, uh, it's also very vocal. So that's a good one to learn as you're almost like a reference point for your other woodpeckers. So the other woodpecker that I wanted to feature uh, that's among our breeding ones would be the little downy woodpecker. And so it sounds and that's that little 
That's that little horse whinny sound that I like to call. So just a couple of features about the woodpeckers. Um, with, the, with the red belly, in this particular photograph, you really can't see the red on the belly. And it's not a real, real prominent field mark on the bird uh, in terms of one that you can readily see. But they do indeed show a little champagne blush of red kind of down here on the belly uh, between the leg uh, areas. And so this is a good one to get to know. And then the downy woodpecker is another one that's worth knowing. Uh, the one that's kind of the, uh, the, the almost the lookalike is the hairy woodpecker. And that is one that is about twice, maybe not twice the size, time is uh, size and a half again of the downy is the hairy woodpecker. Uh, and a good way to tell them apart is that the downy has got these little black spots on the outer edges of the white tail feathers uh, that are on the edges of the tail, which I realize is not the most prominent field mark. But if you see it, then you know that you've got the downy woodpecker. And then the other thing that's worth noting, and truly the downy versus the hairy, they look almost identical. The hairy woodpecker has just got white feathers. It doesn't show the black. And it has a much bigger bill. And so the way that I kind of keep them straight in my head is that if the bill length from the tip of the bill to the base of the head is shorter, or the base of the bill from the tip to the base is shorter than from the base of the bill to the back of the head, so it's the short little bill, that's the downy. And if the bill is longer, it's out to here and the tip of the bill to the base of the bill is the same distance as from the base of the bill to the back of the head, then you have a herring. So the easy way for me to remember it and hopefully now for you is to say that the downy has a dinky bill and the hairy has a honker. So you can either hate me or love me for giving you that little tip, but I can assure you that is one that will stick with it regardless, because a lot of times when you see these birds, they're by themselves. And if you just see something by itself, it, it, it might be hard to get a sense of how big it is. So you can use the bird itself as a measuring stick. So how big is the bill in relation to the head? The downy has the dinky bill, the hairy has the honker. And then the other woodpecker that we have, uh, and certainly familiar to you, and certainly that you would notice, are all of the uh, sapsucker drill marks uh, that you'll see in the tree. If you've noticed these and didn't know what they were, well, that's the work of the yellow-bellied sapsucker. So this is the bird that's just here in the wintertime. They're still here now, but in another month or so, they will all be gone and have moved back north to breed. Uh, but this is one that uh, our wintering woodpecker, and they drill these holes in the tree to generate the sap wells, and then they will come back. You can even see a little bit of the sap that's glistening here in the little wells. And so they will come back and sip the nectar out of the sap well, or they will come back and um, feed on the edge of this as well. So it's not just the sap suckers that will take advantage of this. So let's move on to some of the other birds that we would see. And so we've got various birds of prey. One of them would certainly be the red-tailed hawk. Uh, a good way to tell them uh, from the other hawks is that the red tails will show this belly band. The, the black, or I should say that the white that you see on the back of the bird is kind of a scatter shot. And I'll compare that in just a minute to a similar looking species. Um, but the white is just kind of diffuse. It's diffuse modeling, and it's not a real, real distinct pattern. And then you'll see this belly band. So that is the 
uh, red-tailed hawk. It's one of our beauties. It's one of the soaring hawks. And in an adult bird, the tail is actually a brick red color on the upper surface. So this is a bird that's worth knowing what it sounds like because when it calls, it's very distinctive. So listen to this and tell me if you don't think, it. I'll give you a little clue first, but we'll listen and then we'll compare it to something. Red-tailed hawk. So a little bit of a shrieking kind of a noise. And just if, if you're a fan of I Am, of the old Western that you know, I used to watch as a kid on TV, whenever they would show somebody that was, you know, struggling at, on their last breath and they're, you know, they're dying out in the desert and the horses uh, are not doing well. And then you see the vultures circling overhead. Well, of course the vultures are usually silent. They are silent. But invariably, they will play the call of the red-tailed hawk just because it says, I'm the rugged west, and this is the sound of the rugged west, is this red-tailed hawk. Uh, and it's the same way. They'll show like a bald eagle soaring or what have you. And because a bald eagle has this wimpy sound that it makes, the, the TV people, the movie people, always dub in the sound of the red-tailed hawk. I don't know why they do that. Um, for years, Buick car commercials, you know, they would show the car driving <laughs> across the American West, and lo and behold, insofar as it gets used in a lot of soundtracks. So a similar hawk and certainly one that can be found along the creek are the red-shouldered hawks. And so in this particular bird, which was actually photographed at Altadena Park, you can see the red in the shoulder. Uh, and so it doesn't show the belly band. It's, it's, this is an adult bird and it shows you this nice red breast with this red in the shoulder. And it sounds entirely different. So that's one that sounds entirely different from the red-tailed hawk, but these are birds that share the same habitat as barred owls, believe it or not. And one of their favorite things to eat, both the barred owl and the red-shouldered hawk, are things like frogs and snakes and crayfish, things that they catch at the creek's edge. So red-shouldered hawk is certainly a bird of riparian uh, forested areas. Uh, Broadwing hawk, uh, I think Linda had mentioned that she had just been hearing some of those. They just recently returned within the past couple weeks. Uh, it too is one of the soaring hawks. It's, as you can see, it's kind of an overall brownish color. It's the smallest of the soaring hawks that we have. And this is a call that you'll hear in forested areas. Quite often you may not see them unless they're up soaring but they have a very distinctive thin whistle that you can Broad hear. Broad-winged hawk. So just a very thin whistle. So that's one as you're going along in the canoe and you're passing a forested spot, well, this could certainly be a bird that you could hear. And then of the owls that we have along the creek, probably the one that's the most elusive would be the great horned owl. It's certainly the largest owl in Alabama. Uh, the ears are actually just feather tufts. They're, they're not really, they don't serve a purpose for hearing, but they do help to camouflage the bird. It breaks up its profile if they are you know, up against a tree trunk somewhere. 
But when you hear them, it's just a very soft hooting noise. It's not very loud at all. Great horned owl. Ooh, 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 ooh. And then compare that to the very loud call of the barred owl. Barred owl. And if you listen to that, you can actually hear there's a Chuck Will's widow calling in the background of, of this particular sound file. Bard Owl. You can hear that Chuck Will Widow. And both of our large owls, the great horned and the barred owl, have got young now. They actually start nesting uh, in pretty much in the dead of winter, so that this time of the year, the young are out of the nest. Uh, and it just so happens that this is the time of the year when the young squirrels are also uh, making an appearance, their first uh, appearance in the spring. And so, uh, Mother Nature has a way of providing the food resources that these owls need. The smallest of the owls that we have here is the eastern screech owl that comes in a gray morph, and then there's also a red morph. And I will mention that they don't, sometimes they'll be referred to as phases, but they're not truly phases. A, a red screech owl, a red morph screech owl is always going to be red, and a gray phase or a gray morph is always going to be gray. Uh, but this is one that is, it's such a tiny little bird and because they are, you know, the great horned owls will actually feed on these guys. And so um, they can be really elusive. Uh, and just, I guess it was maybe two weeks ago, I was there at the Shade Creek Greenway and I ran into a gentleman who, um, I'm drawing a blank on his name. I wanna say it was Claude but I can't recall the last name, but he, he was from Sanford University. And he mentioned to me that he had been following a family of screech owls uh, that was there right by where the bridge that crosses over the creek by the high school, by Homewood High School. But this is a bird that's just a tiny little bird, probably more common than we think, uh, but because they're so secretive, we just don't see them. And so this is the time of the year when these guys are starting to breed. Another, another month or so, um, they'll have uh, eggs <clears throat> and they'll be incubating eggs and raising young uh, in the early part of the summer. Smaller birds uh, that you might expect to see along Shades Creek. So certainly wood thrush would be one that if you have a nice forested setting along the creek, Wood thrush, sadly, it's a bird whose numbers are declining, but oh Lord, what a beautiful bird. And um, when you see the thrushes like this that have this kind of counter shading, a warm coloration on the back, and then the spots on the breast, well, the reason they're like that is that these are birds that spend a lot of time near the ground or on the forest floor, and the spotting on the breast offers a nice counter shading so that it blends in really well with the dappled sunlight effect on the forest floor. So it really helps them kind of disappear into the habitat when they're on the ground. But this is the bird whose song is unmistakable. So let's take a listen. Wood thrush.
So just a spectacular bird. They should be coming back in another couple weeks. You'll start to hear them uh, in your wood. And I mentioned earlier that the wood ducks will nest in boxes, and certainly that is true of eastern bluebirds as well. I noticed this past Sunday when we were at the Audubon Session Sanctuary that the put up uh, right there at the end of Leech Drive. So they will certainly, uh, this particular pair was nesting in this old uh, chopped off uh, telephone pole, but they will readily accept a nest box as well. Um, some of the other birds that are common uh, in the dense areas, and even in your yards, of course, would be the Carolina Wren. So this is one, this is another bird that you really need to get to know the song of this bird because it's a good reference point. Tea Carolina kettle. Wren. Tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. So this is a bird that will certainly nest in your yard. If you've got hanging baskets with plants or for your plants, they'll nest in those. If you wear, leave out a pair of old shoes, clothes, a bag, just you name it, they will nest in it. They are very common around uh, human habitation. I can recall several years ago, one of my friends called me from uh, Trustville to say that he had a, a bird that was nesting in his bathroom and it turned out to be a, a Carolina wren. Uh, and the reason it picked it was because it had been a pretty day and, and Richard left his back door open all day long. And in the span of several hours, this bird had managed to bring in enough leaf litter and debris to uh, start constructing a nest in his bathroom. And he wondered what could he possibly do? And I said, well, Richard, you've got two choices. You can either go ahead and just, you know, discard the nest. my second suggestion, which was to leave a bathroom window open, it was one that he could leave open and the birds could get in that way. And so he just kept the bathroom door closed and the window open and they managed to get along just fine. So the Carolina wren is one that we have here year round. And I put in this photograph of this house wren because even though this is one that's more common in winter, um, it is one that, for whatever reason, over the years, um, I have come to associate the area that's there around Shades Creek at Elder by where Flora Johnston Park is, um, that that particular little, there's been a little enclave of house friends that nest in that area. So if that's a bird that you Rowan has reported them. So some other birds uh, that would nest along the creek, some of our swallows, the purple martins, the barn swallow, and the northern roughwing swallow. So these are all birds that like to be near water. And so if there's a bridge overpass, which certainly we have plenty of those along the course of the creek, they will nest up under the bridges. So all of our swallows uh, would be birds that you could associate and see along the creek. Some of the other birds that we have different types are the flycatchers. So we have an Eastern Phoebe, which is a year round bird for us. And this is one that will readily nest uh, up under the eave of your house. Um, and thankfully this is one who's not, he's vocal, not very musical, but he's a namesayer. Eastern Phoebe. Phoebe, 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 Phoebe. So this is a very, very common. What they like to do is to perch on a twig like you see here in this particular uh, Phoebe. 
um, and they will sail out, sally out from the perch and catch an insect uh, in flight, and then they'll come back to the perch and eat it. And so in this particular case, uh, you can see really well the, what they call the rictal bristles around the beak of the bird, around the base of the beak. And those are specialized feathers that when they are trying to catch an insect, when those feathers contact the insect, it helps them to get a sense of where it is and they will snap their bill closed around it. But that's the Eastern Phoebe. So get to know that one, very common. Just now starting to return is the great crested flycatcher, considerably larger than the Eastern Phoebe, a little bit Noise. Crested flycatcher. So it sounds a little bit like a police whistle. So they do that kind of a chattering noise and that's a really good thing to listen for because they like to spend a lot of time in the canopy and unless they're flying out to catch an insect, they can be hard to spot. They're really uh, quite well camouflaged. They are cavity nesters. So if you've got nice uh, stand of mature woods with some uh, holes in the trees, good habitat for the flycatcher, the great crested in particular. So another one that I wanted to feature is the Acadian flycatcher because this is truly a bird of riparian forest. They like to be in the understory, hard, hard, hard to find them uh, because they just, they sit there and all they do is sing. And the only time they fly is to go out and catch an insect and to come back. But if you listen for them, they are there. And, Maybe it's your favorite food. I know it's one of my favorites, but that's the pizza. So tell me if you don't see that this tell that this bird isn't asking for a pizza. Acadian flycatcher. So what do you want for lunch? Pizza. What do you want for dinner? Pizza. What do you want for breakfast? Pizza. So that's all they say is just pizza. Um, hard to find, uh, but when you listen for them, you can find them. And I guarantee you they're along the creek. You just have to listen for them. This is not a bird you're going to find by looking for it. You're going to find it by listening for it. And then one that's similar to that is the Eastern Wood Peewee. Also more wooded, uh, maybe not so much tied to the creek, uh, but certainly could be found along the creek. And thankfully, it too is a namesayer. So listen for the peewee. Eastern wood peewee. So peewee, peewee. And so here we have uh, one of the vireos. There's two vireos that would certainly be along the creek, red-eyed vireo. Very, very common bird, but it's the bird of the canopy. And so it's hard to find them, but if you listen for them, they're there. Listen for this. Red-eyed vireo. And so this is the bird that will do this all day long. Look at me way up high in the tree. Look at me way up high in the tree. They're counter shaded, so they're green up top, light underneath. They blend in really well with the canopy so that this too is another bird you have to listen for. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have the white-eyed vireo that tend to uh, spend its time in the understory, dense understory. White-eyed vireo. So very emphatic calls of the white-eyed vireo, and they are certainly back now as well. 
So let me go ahead and just hit a few more birds for you. I mentioned you want to get to know the common birds. So here we have the American robin, which I know that you know what that looks like, but this is one that you need to know what it sounds like. American robin. So chirlip, chirly, chirlip, chirly. Compare that to the summer tanager, which are just now coming back. This is a robin-like song, long phrases, short pauses. Summer tanager. So I wanted to play that a little bit longer just because at the very end there, you heard the, heard the petiti tuck kind of the call notes, not the song, but the call notes, the petiti tuck. So that kind of gives it away. Sounds a little bit like the robin, just a little bit more hoarse. So this is a bird I mentioned earlier that this is one of the species that you will find uh, feeding on tulip poplar blossoms. Similar to that, doesn't look like it at all, and certainly birds that will come to your feeder. But think of this rose-breasted grosbeak as a robin that took opera lessons. Rose-breasted grosbeak. So there you have it, the, the, uh, the opera lesson uh, singing rose-breasted grosbeak trying to do its best imitation of a robin. So let me just close out with a few of the warblers that you might expect to find along the creek. If you have pine trees in the area, certainly pine warblers would be a really good choice of what to listen for. Sounds a little bit like just a sweet sewing machine kind of a sound. Same note. Pine warbler. So just the same note repeated, a very sweet note. Thankfully, this is one that starts singing early uh, in the year. And so they're well on their way to nesting, but because they like to stay in the canopy, you don't often see them. Another one that we have, I'm going to skip over a few of these. I want to get to one that is certainly a bird that's found lower. Uh, historically, that you would have found them in the cane breaks, but now they have said, you know, these stands of Chinese privet along the creek will do just quite nicely for us. They're not particularly common, but they do like the dense stands of dense understory along the creek. And so that's the Swainson's Warbler. And listen for this whip, 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 whipper will. Swainson's Warbler. So that's the Swainson's Warbler. And then we'll compare that to this Louisiana Water Thrush which thankfully is much more likely to be out in the open. That, that photograph that I shared earlier of the riffles along uh, Shades Creek there at Jemison Park, perfect Louisiana water thrush habitat. Uh, this too is a bird that likes to wag its butt uh, a little bit. Um, and then this is another song that you wanna get to know because truly a bird that you could find along the creek. Louisiana water thrush.
And then the last of the warblers I would like to mention is the northern parula. And this too is a bird of the canopy, but it is really quite common. Uh, I will mention it's the only warbler with a lower uh, yellow mandible. So if by chance, if you are going along the creek and you're walking or maybe you're in the canoe or what have you, and you kind of hear this bird singing overhead, you can exclaim to your companions, oh, would you look at the yellow bill on that bird? And they will just be so impressed that you were able to see that when they can't even see the bird. And what you're not gonna share with them is that you heard it and you know that it's up there because it has a very distinctive song. So let's listen for it. Northern Parallel. So just an ascending trill with a little hiccup at the end. So in parallel, by the way, truly translates into little green. And so there's that little bit of green that you can see on the back of the male northern uh, parallel. So my last bird is just the northern cardinal, just because they're such pretty birds. And truly the last bird that starts, that sings at night, right before we're all going to bed, then you can hear them kind of chipping at night and they're saying good night to you. And um, so that's one that you would want to get to know as well. So I know that I've gone uh, probably a little bit too long, but I will be glad to, I'll stop the screen share here and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, and maybe Michelle, if you can help me, if there's some that I've missed or something like that, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, so do we have any questions out there for Greg? Greg, I, I didn't hear the Cardinal. Could Can you go uh, back and play the Cardinal for us? Yeah, I'll be happy to go back and play the Cardinal. So let me go. I think I have to share my screen again in order for that. Okay. To okay. So let me go back and <clears throat> go back to I'm it. So, I'm sorry to make you do that again. That, that's quite all right. Quite all right. Northern Cardinal. I think of it as here, birdie, 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 birdie. And it, it does have several sounds, right, Greg? The card yes, it does. Yeah, that, that sound sounds really common. It, yes, it's a common bird. I'm hoping that they'll play the little chip. There you go. I'll stop the screen share. So that chip note that you hear is really, uh, it carries well, even though it's not particularly loud. Um, but that is one that you should definitely listen for. And, and cardinals can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, typically they do, they hear birdie, 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 birdie. But they have up to like 40 different distinct songs. Uh, that they do. So you really want to kind of get used to the, the tone of the song more than the specific here, birdie, birdie, birdie. So, uh, but if you, if you have, you know, if, if you're trying to learn more of the bird song, if you'll give me just half a minute, I can share my screen again. And one of the websites that I like to go to, um, let me see, let me pull up here. Um, so here's the Scarlet Tanager. This is another all about, it's all, all about birds. It's another Cornell Lab of Ornithology website. So it's just called All About Birds. And I actually have up here the Scarlet Tanager, which the Summer Tanager and the Scarlet Tanager, we have both of them here as breeding birds. They're just now starting to come back. And they can both be found, typically the scarlet is more likely to be found in the higher elevations around here. Uh, but it too um, sounds a little bit like a robin. So let's just take a half a minute to listen and 
compared to the summer tanager, you remember that the summer tanager had long phrases and short pauses. So here we have just the reverse on the scarlet. It's short phrases and long pauses. Okay, so take a listen. So short phrases, long pauses. Okay. So in one other bird that I thought would probably be worth, uh, let me see if I can get that guy to shut up a minute, um, is the Kentucky warbler. So this is another bird that you would typically find along dense forested areas, almost the same kind of habitat that you would find for slinks and warbler, uh, but it's one that's a little bit more common, and that is the Kentucky warbler, just a beautiful bird. Uh, all of the warblers that like the dense, thick understory where it tends to be a little bit more shaded, they all have larger eyes in comparison to the other warblers because it lets in more light. Um, but if you listen to this, if you recall the sound that I played of the Carolina wren, that the tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. So I like to think being a galloping version of the Carolina wren. It's like it can't finish one phrase before it starts the next one. And, and it truly it's the case of if I, if I think I'm hearing it, I'll stop a minute and say Carolina Wren or Kentucky Warbler, and then I'll stop and look at the habitat. And if I am in an area that's dense uh, and along the creek somewhere, I'm thinking Kentucky Warbler. It does sound a little bit like the Kentucky Warbler, excuse me, like the Carolina Wren, but it's just like, kind of like the galloping gourmet version of the Kentucky Warbler. So I'll stop that. No, oh, he's going to keep singing. <laughs> Crazy bird just doesn't know when to stop. So I'll stop the screen share again. So I, 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 so I brought up that all about birds because it's a really great resource. Both eBird and All About Birds are free. Um, you don't need to, there's no subscription or anything like that. Great resources for, um, for learning about birds. And so the, the sound files are there. You can read up about the habitat preferences, what they like to eat, you know, how many eggs they lay, when do they nest. Greg, this, this morning I was walking up to Sanford the back way about nine o'clock and heard a wood thrush. Oh, you, awesome. say, you say they've just, they just have come in? Is that Yeah, they are just now back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it's truly a, a bird that likes a nice little forested hatch. It doesn't have to be huge. But it needs to be, you know, a good patch of woods for them is what they really do uh, like to have. Um, and so good, good on you for having one in your neighborhood, or at least Sanford having one in, in the area. I love listening to those birds. I, I can recall the year you know, we were up at the Audubon Mountain Workshop and we would hear them calling from the slope up behind the, the, the you know, the, the dining hall the meth hall. So just wonderful birds. I just, I can't listen to them enough. They're just fantastic. Greg, this is James Lowry. Um, hey, I have heard, I think maybe way in the past, Eastern bluebirds, they want a wide open area with an edge of trees or whatever. Mm -hmm. But do you also see them, and we've seen some around Shades Creek, that don't seem to be in that kind of habitat per se. Um, do they prefer that or they just happen to 
be there sometimes or so i think with the bluebird that they will be in a relatively small open area but what they typically like is to have an open area adjacent to some woods and so the open area doesn't have to be particularly large and the woods don't necessarily have to be particularly large but they typically do like to have that when they're perched in the box looking out that they've got at least a little bit of, of open area in front of them. And I guess the example that I always use is uh, those of you that remember Harriet Wright, and perhaps you have been to her house, uh, she had just the smallest postage stamp of a lawn <laughs> in her front yard and in the backyard. That was clippers, it was, you know, that small of a yard. But she had bluebird boxes that nested in the front and in the back. And, and truly her patch of grass might be 15 feet by about 20 feet. It, it, there was practically nothing. But she was in the middle of the wood. And I guess maybe the other thing was that she used to feed them quite well. They, they ate well. Uh, her, she, she provided them with mealworms. I always said that if I ever died and came back in an afterlife, I wanted to be a bird at Harriet Wright, at Harriet Wright. Yeah, there's a person who lives a block from Homewood Library and she has them come into her feeder all the time, so. Yeah, so they, they typically, I mean, that's a bird that will nest in a bluebird box uh, and, and of course, I mean, Boxes are just in high demand in period, just regardless. There's any number of species that will compete with them for the bluebird box, including things like tree swallows, which we don't have a whole lot of them here, but they're starting to increase their numbers as breeding birds. And they too are a bird that likes to be near water. So if you have a bluebird box that's kind of near the creek, don't be surprised if a the tree the swallow shows up flip. and evicts the, evicts the bluebird. So we've <laughs> seen them also where there's no... They don't so have they would, humans putting boxes up. Yeah, so they would be nesting in natural cavities, but they are okay, cavity like, nesters, yeah. Like the tree stump or the tree trunk that you showed. Yes, exactly. So, Several years ago, I read a, or saw just a news piece, I guess, about a research study that had shown, interestingly, that the bluebirds that are in high trafficked areas and have a lot of noise, such as Oak Mountain State Park and the drive going in, that they were less productive, um, you know, as far as reproduction. Uh, but we seem to put our bluebird boxes where a lot of people will see them and therefore a lot of people and noise uh, is around. Yes, it, it's a noise does indeed affect them and even how the, the, the songs that they sing and not only does it affect their ability to, for breeding purposes, their breeding success, it also affects how loud they sing. Oh, oh yeah. So. And, and you know, uh, honestly, I think over the last probably 25 years, at least in the Homewood area, the bluebird population has really bloomed back up again. Because when I remember as a very young kid seeing them around, and then for years and years and years, I never saw them. And when I first moved into this house 23 years ago, I didn't ever see them. And then a couple of years after I moved here, I began to see a few. And now I see them everywhere. And so it's interesting how it's sort of, you know, gone down and come back up for whatever reason. Yeah, the Shades Creek Greenway is a really good place to find Eastern bluebirds. You know, they come to my suet feeder. So I, I'll just close by just mentioning that um, the work that Friends of Shades Creek does in terms of help. Uh, 
one of the things that I tried to impress upon people is that no matter how big or how small your little patch of earth is, uh, there's always something that you can be doing to provide habitat for the birds. Uh, and so, you know, whether it's just a little stretch of creek that you're helping to maintain, or whether it's your backyard, or whether it's, you know, plants that you're putting out on your balcony, or whatever, um, there are birds that will take advantage of it. Um, it's just, it, it's one of those things. I mentioned earlier about the, you know, eBird data. Just a couple years ago, National Audubon, along with Cornell Lab of Ornithology, published a really, really comprehensive study where they documented the decline over the past, say, 40 or 50 years of our bird populations to the point where we've lost over 3 billion with a B birds over the years. And so, and I guess maybe a really good way that I thought make it, made it uh, hit home with me uh, years ago, we used to go look at birds. And now when we do our trips, we go look for birds. So we will always have the northern mockingbirds and the cardinals with us because they're habitat generalists. It's the habitat specialists that really need our help. And so certainly the you know forest and habitat. Um, I, I can remember several years ago now uh, there was an issue that came up out at Oak Mountain State Park, and there was a, a quote. A, a, a daily paper, um, somebody from the state, I can't remember if it was somebody with the, like with the state parks division or game division or what have you, but they made the comment that um, tulip poplar trees and what, so I guess what they meant to say was that they don't produce mast for the deer to eat or the turkeys. And so I thought, well, you know, if perhaps that person had just spent an afternoon sitting up there and the tanagers that feed, I think 87 different species of birds have been documented feeding on the blossoms of tulip poplars. And I'm like, how could you just, and so that, you know, they were saying that they were gonna log the trees. That was the gist of the article that that was one of the species that they were gonna target for logging was the tulip poplars because they didn't provide food for wildlife. And I thought, well, that's, that's just an uninformed uh, <laughs> opinion to be making in my opinion. Great, so, when, you, um, when you look at yellow poplar from Beneath the tree, they're fairly inconspicuous, but uh, I've been in Blunt County on a, a, a bluff looking down on blooming yellow poplars, and the, the flowers are just like like targets. Oh, uh, yeah. That I guess would be, I guess, very obvious to a migrating bird to look down and see that. So that you say there are 87 species that... Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really... Good, and it, it's not some, I mean, it, in some cases, it's the nectar that they're feeding on, like with the Orioles and the, um, and the tanagers, but the nectar that the, the insects that are attracted to it is another source. And I'll have to show you, I'll send you a picture, Henry, of a picture that I have of a tulip poplar blossom uh, that I photographed at Railroad Park. And right, the blossom hasn't opened yet, but there's a tiny little hole at That's the deep. base where the oriole said, I know where that nectary is. And he pierced the blossom before it even opened to get to the nectar. I mean, it's just, it's as obvious as it's, it's the nose on your face, as they say, uh, that that's what they were doing. And now I will say that um, it, uh, some of the trees, a lot of the oak trees, uh, which obviously are good at producing the acorns and things that the deer will eat and the turkey, uh, also are host to any number of uh, 
for uh, for birds. And I, you know, I didn't have a picture of a of a uh, yellow billed cuckoo, but that is one that if you find an area where the tent caterpillars are, major, major, major food magnet for the yellow billed cuckoo. I mean, they just are all over those. So. I don't know if there's a particular association between yellow-billed cuckoos and certain tree species, but I do know that when you find yellow-billed cuckoos and you find the tent caterpillars, I should say it's when you find the tent caterpillars, that's when you're going to find the yellow-billed The tent caterpillars tend to, I found, uh, produce the, the, their nests in black cherry. And I've been driving into Kentucky from a forest in the uh, in the cherry trees. So I don't know if that has anything to do with the birds that might feed on. Well, it'll be before the berries were produced anyway. I guess I, guess. I'm, I, uh, I haven't really thought of when all those being produced at. Uh, uh, Cahaba River Park last year, all those tents, was it when the fruit was developing or what, when they were flowering? I just don't remember. But there could be multiple food sources, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, both, both caterpillars and blooms with associated insects. Yeah. It, when The other thing I should mention about the tent caterpillars, I can remember several years ago, I uh, was down at Perry Lakes Park uh, down near Marion. And I came across a northern parilla that had just landed right next to a, you know, a tent of the tent caterpillars. And the caterpillars were just crawling, you know, all, all inside of the tent. And I thought, oh, this bird is just going to have a field day eating all those caterpillars. Well, lo and behold, he was not there to eat the caterpillars. He was there to harvest the tent, the silk, if you want to call it that, so that it could use that in the construction of its nest. So I thought, well, you know, if it's not a spider web, it's a tent caterpillar. Somebody's going to make use of it for sure. Any other questions that you might have? You have other questions? Look who I have here, Greg. We have I see. Have yes. the watcher here. Yes. And here's another one behind me. Let's see. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. I think you'll let you turn off your background. Oh, there he is. There he is. <laughs> Sweet. Y'all are like ghosts. You keep appearing and disappearing from the I know. Water. I know. Because yeah. I put the background on. <laughs> We, we've been watching birds today. This is Lucy. <laughs> yeah, so if you're there in Raleigh, um, so you're probably about a week behind us in terms of the birds coming to you as well. And, and truly, I mean, migration is just now hitting its, its stride. So if I would, I mean, the timing of our program was just perfect because I can assure you the birds are, are moving through. So I would encourage you to, to get on out there. Um, and if you're worried about, oh, I don't recognize the sounds of all these birds. Uh, available from Cornell Lab of Ornithology, it's called Merlin. And so the Merlin app, you download it to your phone. And when you hear a bird out in the field, even if you don't have uh, internet connection, you can record the sound. Uh, and I say internet, whether it's you know cellular or Wi-Fi, what have you. Uh, you can record the sound and then play it back. And for the most part, Merlin does a pretty good job. I noticed. I know Catherine, uh, who's on our call tonight, have, have used it as well. And and I will periodically use it also. Now, the one thing I will mention is that Merlin um, may sometimes give you like a couple of different choices, or it may just be totally out of, in left field, which kind of surprises me because I, I would think that it would know 
you know, where you are, especially if you're connected via cellular data, it, it would know, you know, what the birds are in, in your particular area. And Catherine, do you remember what the, the one that you sent me recently? It, and it, 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 and you may have to unmute yourself, but it, the suggested bird was a Western species, which kind of surprised me. Yeah, we, we can't hear you because you've got your, your, you've muted yourself. So, but anyhow, so I just, I just remember thinking, oh, well, that's not, you know, it, it, it should have known better. And so actually, and so that's one of the things on the Cornell on that app is that if you know that that's not what it is, you have the ability to say, no, this isn't it. So that it's kind of learning, it's, it's AI intelligence. It, it's, it's kind of learning, okay, this is what it is versus this is what it is. Great. We have a question here. My, my son, Matt, has a question. Sure. He saw, he saw um, a log or a, uh, a stick, I guess, that had like, and I forgot to download the pictures, got like four or five big birds. And Matt, tell him how the birds acted. They were waterfowl. They were just like standing in a line. They were what? Standing in a line. They were standing in a line on a like a stick with long necks. And he said when they were in the water, you just saw the necks. Mm -hmm. You just saw the necks in the water. You didn't see the bodies. Is that right? It had to be Anhinga, right? Um, well, so Anhinga is the possible. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's some at Limestone Park in Alabaster, and they also get them up at Na uh, Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge. But I think that if they're in Raleigh, my guess is that what you're probably seeing would be a uh, double-crested cormorant. So they can look similar and they have similar behaviors in the, you, when you see them in the water, they can have their body below and just their head sticking up, yeah, kind of like the Anhingas do. So, so the way that you really tell them apart is that the Anhinga has just a dagger-like bill. It comes to a really fine point and they will actually spear the fish when they're catching it versus the cormorants have got a little bit thicker bill and it's got a hook on the end. So they will dive after the fish and they will grab it with their beak and they use the little hook on the end to secure, if you want to call it that, you know, this little wriggling fish. So they look somewhat similar. And then the cormorants, we have them here in the wintertime and in the summertime, but generally they're just winter birds for us. Um, they, they tend to go back further north uh, in the summertime. But that would be my guess is that what you're seeing are the uh, double crested cormorants. Okay. Especially if it's a larger, it, was it a fairly large body of water, like a pond or a river? It was a, a small river. He said it was a small river. Okay, yeah, I would, I would probably go with a double-crested cormorant on that. One. And, and they're social. And they're social. Yes. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Okay. Because when you see one, you see a lot of them. Because there were like four or five. I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you a picture later. But there's like. Four, five, six, you know, on a, on a, oh, there's like 10 of them on a, on a stick. No, oh, okay. Just pull it up on your Merlin app. Go to explore birds on the Merlin app and, and uh -huh. put in a cormorant. Okay. And we'll, it'll bring up pictures. Okay, we'll do that. Yeah. Or, or all about birds. Okay, that's, yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see that Catherine is now on without, so Catherine, are you yeah, ready? Yeah, I think I'm, I can't remember if I told you that it gave me a California gnat catcher or some kind of Western tanager. But um, one thing I have noticed is it, it'll get a little bit confused. If I was standing under a red eyed vireo one day that was just singing its heart out. And when I first turned it on, it said Philadelphia vireo. So I think it got confused because those two sound so similar. Yeah. And when you first start it, I think sometimes it'll give you, it'll get 
just a fragment of a call and give you the wrong thing. But once it gets a minute to sort of hear the whole call, then it'll be a lot more accurate. If yeah. the, I mean, that's just my guess. I don't know for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I know the other app that's also, I mean, Merlin has uh, photos and things like that, but there's another Cornell app that it's just called BirdNet and it does the same thing in terms of analyzing the call but when you do the and maybe Merlin is the same way but when you pull up when you've got the sound you actually have the the sonogram you can tell it the actual part you want it to analyze so it's not looking at the whole sonogram it's just looking at the part that you say okay it's this little segment right here that, and you can actually see it, you know, like, okay, so these are the notes that are being portrayed as I'm hearing them. This is what I'm seeing, and I can see those notes on the sonogram, and so you say, okay, analyze from here to here, and then that's when it will come up, but the videos can be kind of tricky, uh, and, you know, I guess another good example, red-eyed video that I played earlier common birds. Bob Reed always used to say, oh, it's the most common bird of the eastern deciduous forest. And I can remember having a conversation one time with Harriet Wright, and I, we were talking about the fact that the, um, the blue-headed vireo of Mountain State Park, but only in the upper elevation, um, sounds almost identical and it's described as being a sweet version of a red-eyed vireo. And I just, you know, I would sit there and listen to the red-eyed and I would listen to the blue-headed. And to me, they just sounded the same. And I just remember Harry going, oh no, it's a much sweeter, <laughs> it's a much sweeter sound. And so I can remember being standing on the ridge at uh, Horn Mountain, I guess. It was part of just west of Chiha. And I was standing at an overlook where there was a, a tower or a communications tower was right behind me. And I was hearing a bird. I'm enjoying the view and I hear this bird singing and I thought, you know, that sounds like a really sweet version of a red-eyed vireo. And I turned and looked over my head and sure enough, about 10 feet up was a blue-headed vireo. So, I guess maybe, and again, it goes back to the fact that I thought of it as being a sweet version of a red-eyed vireo. So I know the red-eyed vireo song, but it was like, it's just a little bit different. Why is it different? Oh, it sounds a little sweeter. So it's when you hear the, when you know the common birds, it's a good example, I guess. Just yesterday, I went by Railroad Park in the morning and I was looking at that solitary sandpiper when all of a sudden I hear this bird singing to my right in, in the tulip poplar. And I'm like, oh, wait, that was an orchard oriole. I couldn't see it, but I thought about it in a minute. No, that's an orchard oriole song. They just, it, it's when you know the common birds, when the uncommon one, that's when it stands out is because it's, it's not the robin, it's not the cardinal, it's not the mockingbird, it's, you know, it's not the, the house sparrow or the house finch. So that's, that's the value in, you know, getting to know the common birds is because the uncommon birds stand out that much more. So you mentioned mockingbirds and we came in late, so you may have already talked about this, but mockingbirds make the sound of other birds. So how do you distinguish between it being a mockingbird versus one that it's imitating? Okay, so, uh, so typically what I do, there's a couple of things. So mockingbirds tend to repeat the phrases like three or more times, and then they will, uh, you know, sing something else, and then they might come back to it, or they might, you know, whatever. And so what I, two things that I typically do is, is the bird that it's imitating, is it in the right habitat for the bird that it's imitating? And it goes back to how frequently is it singing that phrase? So um, another bird, another of the mimic, 
the brown thrasher and the northern mockingbird. We have all three of them here as breeding birds. And they all imitate the sounds of other birds. So the gray cat bird just sings it once before it moves on to another phrase. And quite often will interject the mew sound like a cat. The brown thrasher will sing the phrases twice and then it moves on, you know, put it down, put it down, pick it up, pick it up, put it there, put it there. And then with the mockingbird, it just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on it, at least three or more times that it sings the phrases. So a really good example of that is uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Alabama Audubon staff from the coastal office had come to Birmingham for a, a retreat for the staff. And one morning, uh, some of us met them at Railroad Park. And so I can't remember it was Olivia or Courtney, but one of them said, oh, do you have killdeer here? And I was like, well, you know, we have heard, you know, I have seen killdeer at the park. They actually nested there one year, which kind of surprised me. But sure enough, there was a killdeer Because, and the reason I knew it was not the kill deer was because we were hearing it from like across the street from the park where the warehouse district was. I'm like, you know, unless it was nesting on the roof, which is look around and see is it the right habitat for the bird that's being imitated and how frequently is it singing the, the song? I'm, lo I'm, I'm blocking on the name, but the person who did the brochure about the birds of Aldridge Gardens uh, said that when he would arrive to study the birds and figure them out, he would listen for the mockingbird sounds, what they were doing, and then he would uh, assume that some of those birds were, were local there. Oh, yeah. For those. yeah, that may have been Dan Holloman, I think, maybe. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 it was. Yeah. Uh, Jim, you look like you had a question. Greg, of those three birds that do the mimicking, it, are they all about the same uh, excellence in terms of mimicry, or are some is one better than the other? I, I would, sure. yeah, I would guess that the mockingbird is a little bit better at them in terms of imitating them. There's one at Railroad Park that sounds exactly like a car, you know, a, the door sound when you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the roadrunner used to do the beep beep. Well, this was whatever the car alarm sound was. This mockingbird had it down to a beep. <laughs> so I think of them as being a little better at imitating the other sound. Um, I think that the brown thrasher is more likely, it, it just, to me, it always sounds like it's a horse version, a, a more coarse version of the bird that it's imitating, whereas the mockingbird really is quite good at imitating, you know, whether it's a sweet sound, a soft sound, a loud sound, you know, you name it. Um, the other so, bird, that was just, is, and sometimes I just throw my hands up in the air, is blue jay versus red-shouldered hawk. Right. Um, you know, because if you're in riparian forested areas, they're both, you could both have, you know, both of them. And unless they put in an appearance, I have a really hard time telling them apart. So has anyone figured out why the, those birds are doing the mimicry? Has anybody studied that? I suspect somebody has, although I, I I should probably know the answer to that, but I certainly can't think of what the advantage of it would be. Um, it might just very well be that, uh, you know, perhaps the female mockingbird is listening to the male going, wow, that's quite the repertoire you've got there. Um, it, and maybe if they get older, they add a little more flourish. I, I know that that is true of just birds in general when they're singing their own songs that they will start to add a little bit of a, you know, an extra note here and there. And so that's usually a sign of a bird that's more longer lived. And so 
you know, if the female is picking up on that, then she could say, well, that's a male that's been around the block a few times because he's singing more than just the average song than it, you know, than an inexperienced male might be singing. So there's a really, if you're interested in bird songs, there's a really interesting book by Donald Krumsta uh, on bird songs. And it, it really goes into some great, great detail on different species and why birds sing what they sing at the hours, you know, that they sing. I always tell people, if you've got a bird singing at midnight on a full moon, <laughs> it's a northern mockingbird. <laughs> Do we have well, one of my one of my favorite scenes happened uh, back last September, August September. Uh, I was up in on the waters, the intercoastal waters of eastern Alaska, and around the Juneau area. And you know how down on the coast there'll be a post sticking up, and there'll be a, you know fellow can be sitting right on top of the post, you know, post out in the water or a seagull. Well, there were bald eagles doing that up there. Really cool uh, to see that. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a one of the places that I've had the good fortune of visiting. It there weren't as many bald eagles at the time I was there, but Homer Spit in Alaska is known winter time, and they just show up in huge numbers. It's just kind of like you know we see vultures around roadkill here well up there it's you know bald eagles around the fish and it's just it really is kind of mind-boggling um, to see how common they are up there yeah that's what i found also so, uh, so do we have any other questions out there that we should ask greg before we let him go yeah, would you say the name of that book about bird song again, or the the author? It, yeah, it's Donald Krumsta. It's K R O O M S D A, and I want to say it, it, it's. I think it's just called Bird Song, but if you if you Google his name, uh, it's a rare it's, enough it's, name. You'll get it. Book. Yeah, he, he he goes into great detail. All right, any any other questions out there that we should ask Greg? And feel free to, great. Yeah, feel free to reach out. Uh, if you ever have questions, I always tell people I'm always, I, I'm big into uh, vicarious birding. So if you've got pictures or sound files or whatever, just send them my way. And Jennifer Ackerman, if you're looking for books, The Genius of Birds is is really, she has several books out, but it's a really good one that talks about just how smart birds are. When you talk about being a bird brain, you're really saying somebody's pretty daggum smart. Yeah. Yeah, especially the crows and the ravens, blue jays, all the jays. Good point. Good point. So, all right. Any, any other questions? Well, we sure appreciate everyone being here tonight, and uh, we, we've really retained uh, most everyone, Greg, uh, all this time. So thank you so much for a wonderful program and for all your information. It's always so valuable to me, and I, I just need to hear you all the time so I can remember some of this better. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to help, so don't, don't hesitate to reach out. And I see Jim Brown clapping, and I agree. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Greg. Oh, you bet. It's great to see also so many familiar faces that I haven't seen in a while. So it, it's great to touch base with you all again. And we, we even had Dick Mills and uh, Carol from North Carolina here. I see that. Hey, Dick. So, yeah, we've got a good group here. Thanks again, and we'll let you go. And we just appreciate you, Greg, so much. This has been oh, you all right. Thanks. It was great to see y'all. Thanks again. Bye bye. Y'all later. Bye. 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 <laughs> bye. bye. <laughs>
<laughs> what are you doing? I can do here, it. Sit up here. here, sit up here. There you go. Bye. <laughs> There's Wally. Let's see if we can get hey, it. Wally. I'm trying to get our our screen back to the other screen. Wally, do you like birds? Do you like birds, Wally? Yeah. Good. What's your favorite bird? 